not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Praise be to God. Persecutions against the church. 
It's why people who have the means and the ability to do so, they flee from Jerusalem and they go to Antioch. But the people who remain behind, they're subject to these persecutions. Some are killed, some are martyred. The apostle himself, James, will eventually be also killed during these persecutions. And so it's hard. It's hard for these people because they're living in Jerusalem. They're living where the temple is still standing. Remember, the temple is not destroyed by the Romans until the year 70. So there's about a 40 year period when the Jews are continuing to do everything they've done with all of the music and the choirs and the processions and the incense and all of the ceremonies and this magnificent stone architectural wonder and the huge plaza around it and the markets that were outside of it. <coughs> and as Christians, what are we doing? We're meeting, you know, 20, 30 people in someone's house around this bread and wine. They're arresting us. Some of us have lost our goods. They've confiscated our stuff. This is really hard. And so the whole letter written to the Hebrews, and it's the opinion of St. John of Damascus. St. John Damascene believes that the original text of St. Paul is written in Aramaic. And that it's a Greek translation from that text of St. Paul by one of his disciple secretaries who gives us the text as we have it in the New Testament. But what St. Paul is doing then is comparing the old and the new. Which is why he quotes Jeremiah. We begin with that quotation. You can read it in chapter 8. Talking about the new covenant that God will make with his people. And he says that if Jeremiah, centuries before our Lord, is talking about what is becoming obsolete, that it means it's passing. So you see the temple on the mount. You see this area. You see its beauty. But it's not going to be here forever. This whole covenant is passing away. And our Lord himself told us, this will all be torn down. Which it was in the year 70, and it has never been rebuilt for the last 2,000 years. And that passage and that vanishing of the old covenant of Mount Sinai is what St. Paul is trying to compare. So today is the consecration of the church. And of course, in our tradition, it's the beginning of the liturgical year. This is all new, which is why the holy water was sprinkled on the walls. We re-consecrate the place, the building and the space in which we stand before the divine presence in the holy mysteries. This presence of Christ, the Word incarnate. And it's also a renewal for us spiritually, so it should be. To examine ourselves where I am individually in my spiritual life. Where I am in following the gospel. Not where I was 10 years ago, but where I am now. And where should I be? Now this feast day, historically, is connected with the consecration of the church, the resurrection in Jerusalem. The Constantine built and it was dedicated in 335. So this feast day has been celebrated for the last 17 centuries. And that's its historical origin. But of course, when you look at the hymns, you look at the entrance hymn, you look at the Masmoro, it's clear that it's referencing the church as the body of believers, the body of Christ. This reality of the new Israel, or the Israel of God, as St. Paul calls it. And so we focus upon our faith. We focus upon ourselves as belonging to the Lord, as the baptized, and who have faith. So what St. Paul is doing, and he'll do next week also, again it's chapter 9, these two weeks, which is why the banners and things are in green. Green has the symbolism of growth and of hope. And so this renewal of the year. And someday if we have any dollars, we'll get green vestments. And then we'll match our banners and the tabernacle veil and the rest. But what St. Paul is doing in this letter is he's talking about, he uses the term tent, but of course in his day, the building's in stone, the temple is in stone, but it's still divided in the same two divisions of the old tent, tabernacle. Our word tabernacle means tent from the Latin. 
And from the time of Moses until the time of our Lord, for 15 centuries, originally, uh, literally in a cloth tent, it was divided into two sections. And even in St. Paul's time, the building may have been in stone, but the partitions between the two sections were two curtains embroidered, embroidered cloth that covered these areas over. And as he does, he refers to them still as being tents. And what he speaks about is these two divisions we have of the holy place and the holy of holies. I put them in bold in your bulletin so that you know them in the text. Kaddish, the holy. Kaddish Kaddishe, the holy of holies. It's why in our tradition out of Antioch, in the Aramaic tradition, we have two entrances. Baitoch, Italot. One is the entrance into the Bima, which is an extension then of the holy place of the Old Testament. And then the entrance to the altar of the Kaddish, Kaddish, the Holy of Holies. But the main idea what St. Paul is saying is that what you have in the temple and what you're nostalgic for represents something which is done. And the holy place had the, as he goes through, he lists there, he talks about the lamp, he talks about the altar of incense, he talks about the place where the twelve flatbreads, the twelve large loaves were laid, laid out, incense, another layer of, of bread, and then more incense, and they were laid in front of the curtain on the inside against the second division. They represent the twelve tribes, the twelve clans of Israel. And he talks about every day and each week the ceremonies go on, every morning, every night, the priests come in and they go out of that front tent. And that's where Zechariah in a couple of weeks, for the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, this is where Zechariah is when the angel Gabriel appears to him. And he talks about the men coming in and going out and doing all their ceremonies. He said because the ceremonies in themselves didn't heal anyone. They were incapable of bringing shlom, of bringing full salvation. He said, but the holy of holies, beyond that next curtain, no one ever went in. And he talks about that in there, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And you have the, the box, which is covered in gold. And then the kapora, the seat of mercy is written in English, the kapora, the seat which was the lid of this box, which was solid gold. And then the poles on either side of it, which were also covered in gold, by which the priest carried the ark when it was moving during the Exodus. But this box still had poles and was still there. It's question, at the time of, of our Lord, that room was actually empty. If you read the book of Maccabees, the ark itself is hidden in some mountain in the area around Jerusalem. The famous story of Roman history, he had heard about these strange people in Judea who didn't worship anything, who worshiped an empty space. And Ptolemy famously, when he invaded this area, went into the temple and had them open the curtains for him to see. The Jews were horrified. Because this represented the presence of God. For the pagan Ptolemy, it was just the shock that these people are really stupid because this is an empty room. What kind of religion do they have? They worship air? What is this? But of course, what St. Paul is talking about is what it represents, all the Jews know what it represents. But then he talks about this fact that only once a year and only the high priest would go in here. And Josephus, the historian that's contemporary with our Lord, gives us a wonderful detail. Because remember the ark? You couldn't touch the ark. Not even the priest touched the ark. When the tent would move, you took down that embroidered curtain and you walked forward with it and threw it over the ark. So it was covered in cloth and you carried it by the poles. The poles never came out. You never touched the ark of the covenant. And in the instance, one or two instances in which we have someone do that, they die immediately in the Old Testament. 
So this is the presence of God. And St. Paul now uses, and very much in our Aramaic tradition, that all these things that were happening are historical moments, but they were meant to foreshadow a reality to come. And the high priest would go in only once a year. And Josephus tells us, and gives us a detail that they would tie a rope around the high priest when he would go beyond that embroidered curtain once a year into the divine presence, Shekinah. Because, of course, if he fell over dead, as people had done in centuries past by touching the ark, I'm not going in there. And instead of just leaving a body in the ark, in the Holy of Holies, you could pull the rope and drag the dead priest up. So it's kind of a charming little detail. A little strange at first, but it's giving us the idea of what that was. But St. Paul flips it on its head now in this letter. And he says that what this signified and what the Spirit of God was teaching us by these moments over the last 15 centuries is that the divine presence was closed to us. That the old covenant that's vanishing could not bring us to God. It could make us to its own level pleasing to God from our perspective, but it could not bring us into God. That required God Himself to come in the Messiah. And that's why He then says, for that reason, that when we approach this, this is Jesus who comes as the high priest of the good things which have now arrived. And he enters not just once, but he enters permanently once, not with the blood of bulls and of calves and of goats outside that he brings in to sprinkle inside this room, but his own blood that speaks more eloquently than the blood of Abel. That is the blood, the Eucharist, that blood of the Christ on Calvary. He says he enters into that Holy of Holies once to work our redemption, our full healing once and for all. And that's an important thing. Because what do we do here? Why are we here each Sunday? There is only one priest in the New Covenant. There is only one sacrifice in the New Covenant, which is the eternalized now death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only priest who offers himself in this salvation which makes us whole, which allows us to enter the Divine Presence. And while we have lots of men who run around who are called priests, they're just simply men who are consecrated into that one mystery of the Word of God incarnate, who is the Messiah. And they're no important than those specific grapes or that pile of wheat grain is in the making of the bread and wine that is used in the Eucharist. That's all they are. They are men who are consecrated to make that one priest present here. That one death, historically 2,000 years ago, is made present. Our religion is all about presence of that divine reality that God allows us still in 2018 to stand before. So it's a very beautiful image, and St. Paul's trying to encourage them why. That this is hard, yes, you're meeting in people's homes, they're confiscating your goods, they're arresting you, they've killed some of us. But the reality that you have is sublime. I encourage you to read that chapter 12 that we read on the Feast of All Saints. It's quite beautiful. And next week we come back to this reality. Because when St. Paul writes to the people who are nostalgic for what they lost in the temple on the hill, we have just as real and truly present to us. We've passed from an old covenant, Mount Sinai, to a new covenant, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. And that reality, and on another sermon, we'll talk about the Husoyo, what that means in relative to this letter. But for us, it's a great hope.
Because St. Paul says the reality is, is that when Christ appeared, the high priest of the good things that God had promised, the good things that have now arrived, then the greater and the more perfect tabernacle, the opening and access to the divinity, not just one man once a year, but all of us in our baptism and our faith have the ability. Which is why when our Lord died on Calvary, and we read and we're told in the Gospel that the curtain of the temple is ripped from top to bottom. This is not done by human hands. It's the embroidered curtain before the Holy of Holies. It is that place which St. Paul is telling us as a reminder that it is inaccessible. So read chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. This section in the middle of the letter to the Hebrews. Because that rending of the veil, St. Paul will then tell us, that veil that's torn is the flesh of the Word incarnate in Calvary. The same flesh that we receive in Holy Communion. That is our access to the Hidden Father, the Holy of Holies, the Kaddish, Kaddish. So that when He has come, then that there is a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, but He entered once and for all into the Holy Place, and He has given each one of us personally the ability to enter that same path into the Hidden Divinity, where we find the fulfillment of our hope, our faith, and our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
Glory to God. 
others. When we had transgressed your commandment and fell, you did not abandon us, but like a good and merciful Father, you instructed us. Through the law you called out to us, through the prophets you guided us, and at the appointed time you sent your Son, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, into the world to renew your image. He came down and by the Holy Spirit became flesh of the Holy and Ever Virgin Mary and dwelt among us, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Amen. 
life-giving body, a saving body, a heavenly body, a body that redeems our souls and bodies, the body of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. I make the mixture in this chalice of blood of the covenant of life-giving blood, a saving blood, a heavenly blood of blood that redeems our souls and bodies, the blood of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Peace to your church and confirm their teachings in our souls. We 
Thank you, O oh God the Father, for your great and indescribable love for all people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness. Of the saints, may we obtain a share of the heavenly reward through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus, our Lord, bless us, protect us, and guide us on the path of life. <clears throat> Favorably remember the departed of those who have shared in this Eucharist, and that was offered upon this divine altar. Grant protection to the living and bless them with hope through the prayers of the Virgin Mary and of all the saints, now and forever. Amen. So just to remind you as you go out the door to grab a bulletin and especially to grab the new Maronite voice, which is a magnificent format. It's Monsignor Ferris. He just moved down to take over our publications in Virginia. They've done a beautiful job, so I highly encourage you to take advantage of it both of the entranceways, both the bulletin and the new Maronite voice. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory 